Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you for having me. So we connected via the wonderful world of Instagram and both blogging for Zatu. How, how long have you been playing games for now? Uh, I first started, well, I, I learned Settlers of Catan back in about 2013, 2012. And that was the game that really just made my brain fall out of the back of my skull when I realized how many... I did, you know that was a rabbit hole moment for me yeah. um it took me a little while to get in towards the board game geek website sort of thing and really delving into it but then once i'd played games like carcassonne and takanoko then things really started to accelerate and that was probably about the start of 2017 and since then i've become a total 100 percent board game geek <laughs> I mean, your background suggests that it's accelerated some, somewhat from there. Yeah. <laughs> I can see somebody's played a nasty trick on you and stacked them all vertically, but other than that, it's a very good collection. Yeah, well, they were all horizontal before I started filming, Jim. I turned them just like this for you. <laughs> so you played board games for a couple of years and then D&D &D came into your world. Talk to me about how that happened. Yeah, well, I'm very fortunate to be part of a... Uh, thriving board game community in Suffolk and some people mentioned D&D &D, and I was always on the periphery of those conversations not feeling like I had anything to offer to the conversation so I'd sort of just shuffle my feet and wait for them to start talking about board games again but then one of them eventually asked me I'm starting a campaign and there's a spot do you want to join in and he gave me a couple of YouTube links to check out and he said, have a look, at, just have a look, see what you think. No pressure. Come along for one session. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. So I went along and he lent me some dice and he gave me a character sheet. And we played a session uh, for about three or so hours in one evening, um, a Friday night evening with some other people. And after that session, I was totally, totally hooked. And here I am now, almost two years later, and I'm I'm now a dungeon master, the DM who runs games for other people. Um, and I uh, I'm so grateful for that for that sort of introductory moment. Uh, it was someone that um, introduced me to it from rather than going into it completely blind. Absolutely. So I think that's what most people like me who have never played D&D before need they need that person in their group that knows it and brings them in and gives them that warm easy entrance because i've watched a ton of videos and i still don't understand it at all no one else in my group has done it before people are interested they play board games with me all the time but if we're going to do dnd i know i'm the one that needs to lead it so i need to learn so when you went into that first experience that time having watched a few youtube videos and knowing you walk into a room of more experienced dnd is do you remember how you felt yeah i um, well, the, I, like, like we've already mentioned, my background is in board games. So I went into it f sort of thinking this is going to be a bit like a board game, a strategy board game, maybe uh, with elements of skirmish to it, because uh, there are battles where you fight bad guys. Um, so I went into it with sort of a strategic sort of thinking. Um, and in some ways, uh i'd done some i'd watched some videos about how a campaign sort or how a session works and um in fairness the dungeon master had played before and he spoke us through um the beginning scenario and he eased us into it with uh, a, a calm sort of uh, steady pace but then suddenly the first combat encounter happened and um there was one other person at the table who had played before as well and i think that was really key that mm. there was a total of five of us four players one dungeon master and two of those people had played before one of them being the dungeon master themselves and one of them being one of the players so they could subtly guide us through mm. and when you see someone like that who seems to know what they're doing you feel inspired and you join in mm. and you um take from their lead 
mm. as it were. I think one of the things that intimidates me the most is that the game is, it, well, it appears so freeform that you have to bring a lot of yourself to it. And unless you're really certain what you're supposed to bring, I'd just be intimidated where to start. So, you know, I'd love to have an experience where I could play with an experienced dungeon master, but I think my first experience is going to be when I'm the dungeon master. My, my first ever D&D is going to be when I'm leading it. So it, it, do you think that's possible? Do you think someone like me can go from complete noob to leading something like this? I think it is possible. Um, I, th I think that to a certain extent, the only way you can learn how to be a dungeon master is to sit in that seat and do it. Mm. You could watch a whole bunch of videos and there are some fantastic tutorials out on YouTube. I would recommend um, the YouTuber Matt Colville. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he is a he's the, the, the YouTuber that inspires me to try and um, push myself to think outside the box with regards to dungeon uh, being be a DM. Um, but even after watching a bunch of his videos before I DM for the first time, you still uh, learn by doing yeah. so you can absolutely do it. Um, I, th I suppose one of the, the most intimidating things might be just the the rules. Now, there's, there's um, certainly you can buy, I, I've got behind me here, the Dungeon Master's Guidebook, a monster manual here, player's handbook. Now you don't need those things to start with. Um, you, you can get them if you want, of course, like I have, but you can in theory download a set of core rules for free from dndwizards.com which is wizards of the coast's website and you can download those for free they're a um, diluted course um, key set of rules that you would need to get playing and the other thing you could do is get i would recommend for you not to jump into a massive campaign as your first experience of being a dungeon master i would suggest you consider a one shot mm -hmm. and by a one shot I mean an adventure that in theory has a start middle and end that you can play in one setting mm. oh sorry one session mm. a session being say a friday evening or a sunday afternoon with you and your friends so for that i would just need the rules downloaded pen paper and dice is that is that it yes well well, well in theory that's that's what you need you can also get um a, a, a key element of D, D is having players create their own character mm. which is which is what brings the real personal touch to D, &D is, is and that's what uh makes it stand aside from a regular strategy skirmish game because you play as yourself or not yourself but a um uh, an alter ego <laughs> of yourself i suppose not a predetermined um asymmetrical hero on the <clears throat> within the game uh now you can create your own characters from scratch and when you know how to do it it's a lot of fun mm. but learning how to do that completely blind can be i appreciate quite baffling so what you can do is you can get pre-generated characters where all of those details are filled in for you mm. one of the um starter packs you can get for dnd if you're happy to um uh, by the starter set, uh, which includes an, uh, an adventure called the Lost Minds of Fandelva. That comes with five pre-generated character sheets on that. Okay. That and that, that includes that character. Sorry. That would give you everything you need then, because I, I think creating characters before you've done an adventure, you'd be like, well, I, I don't know. Yeah, what. I think, like, like I said, I think if you can, if you play with someone that knows how to create a character they can step to, uh, walk you through the steps but if you go if you and say four friends sit around a table or, or have a video call and do a session zero which is where you create your characters before the actual campaign you'll probably just you might grind to a halt mm. if you don't actually understand why am i mm. putting numbers in these boxes what yeah. does that mean um and i I would worry that you wouldn't get beyond that if it becomes too overwhelming or too. Yeah, I, I like the idea of doing that 
I think maybe my, my second or third time, but the first time I like the idea of having some preset. Yeah. Cap. So I'll definitely put a link to that thing you just mentioned. Yeah, in, absolutely. So, so um, do you so that, do, so with do that? You, Sorry, with, with that, I'd have the characters, I'd have the story, everyone just picks a character, and then yeah. some starts reading. Is, is that how Absolutely. it works? Absolutely. Well, that, that adventure, um, the D&D starter set, was the first campaign that I ever played in. All right. I right. played and now finished that campaign. Um, uh, so when you say campaign, what are we talking here? Is it like 10 chapters, 20 chapters? Like, what, what's the vibe? So the, that starting campaign uh is a an adventure uh, there's a main core adventure that you can follow um you're dropped into this um fantasy world you've already let's assume you've already chosen your predetermined uh pre-generated character and the the dungeon master i realize i haven't actually explained to you what the role of the dungeon master is so the dungeon master is the narrator the storyteller i think of them as a conduit between the narration and adventure, the the action, and the um, the the group of adventurers, the party, uh, the allied party themselves. They, if you walk into a bar, the dungeon master explains what's going on, who you can see, what you can smell, what you can feel. If you wake up in a forest, the dungeon master explains to you what it's like, maybe what the weather's like, all of these things. They paint the mise-en-scene, they, they create everything for you. Are they getting that from the book, their heads, or a bit of both? I think it's a bit of both. If you've got an adventure like the Lost Minds of Fandelva, for example, it comes with a 64-page uh, adventure. So there will be some flavor text in there for them, to, and they can just read that out to you if you like. Hmm. But some DMs will, uh, Go off piste and explain details that whatever they want, really. It's down to your imagination or uh, if you want to imp just improvise stuff. Yeah. You can so do that. There? Like you could say you've woken up in this forest, it's all peaceful and serene, and that's kind of all the flavor text that you've got. And then you just in your mind say, and 10 dragons come down and start eating you. Like, <laughs> how would yeah. this can you go? Yeah, that certainly could happen. There's a um, system in D and D, where in theory it's like a role, it is a role-playing game, an RPG. So you might have played computer games before, such as I'll, I'll name some modern ones, such as The Witcher or Skyrim, for example, where you start out at level one, and once you've gained a certain amount of experience points, you level up and you become a little bit stronger. You get slightly better armor, you get tougher, more resilient, better weapons. And that's kind of similar in D&D, &D. you can earn experience points. But if you start out at, say, level one, if the dungeon master is anywhere near remotely fair, they will only um, offer bad characters who are at a similar or maybe slightly higher level than you. Not, an, 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 for example, a dragon would probably just completely wipe out a bunch of first level adventurers and of course that's not really that uh well I, I, I for me as a player i don't think i'd find that very fun because the adventure would last five minutes sure so is, are you just relying on the dungeon master to essentially just be sensible with it yeah well there's there's different paths you can take when i dungeon master well when i dm for for my friends i will offer them uh a couple of op options one will be uh, for example, a fair a fair fight. Um, if you want to talk numbers in terms of uh, action economy as to how many people are fighting here versus how many people are fighting here, and how strong they are versus how strong the party is. But sometimes I will throw in a slightly tougher scenario at them, and it's up to the players to think. You know what? I think we should run away because if we do take on those ten dragons weird toast yeah if you if you give them uh if you only ever give the party combats they know in theory we should be able to win there's no sense of real adventure or um realism to that so it seems like the dm's role is quite tricky then to find that balance between fun and challenging but not well, wipe well out if, if you uh 
uh, go by the uh, suggested adventure book, then it will state, for example, uh, you wake up in the forest and it's nice and serene, but then it might be a case of it will suggest there are four goblins. Goblins mm -hmm. are a classic entry level um, bad guy to, to take on. Um, and the, the, the book has sort of worked all that out for you. Mm. Once you as a DM are a bit more experienced and you know the sort of, well, I know that this number of adventurers couldn't really take on a, 10 dragons, but they might be able to take on one. You can then go off piste and then introduce mm. your own monsters uh, that way. But if you're starting out, then I would suggest the rule, the 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 adventure book will will guide you through mm. and tell you how many there are, and then it's up to you as the uh, DM to role play as those uh, goblins, mm. which is where some of the real fun comes in because that's that's part of your your role as as the the DM. You're not just the referee, and you're you're also taking on the role of being all of the NPCs, the non-playable characters in this world. Well, is and, it being the DM, is it fun? Because you're you're kind of in the venture, but you're not. Like, is, is there part of it where you're just kind of watching your friends have a really good time and you're just sort of on the periphery? Or or is it actually really fun just constantly changing? Like, one minute you're an orc, next minute you're a dragon, next minute you're a fairy. Like, how, how much do you prefer being a DM to playing? It's like playing two different games. When you're sitting uh, with your friends around the table as part of the party you're you very much feel like a an allied group of adventurers you feel like uh, you're in it together and you're chatting about what you could do meanwhile if you're the dm at the other end of the table you're sort of sitting like this and just listening to the other players uh uh often worry about something that isn't even an issue mm. I, I don't know if you've played any games like um scotland yard mm. or fury of dracula where it's one versus many mm. now some people might think that D, D is like that that the dungeon master is trying to beat the players but that's not the case at all it is a uh collaborative experience everyone involved the dungeon master isn't trying to win they're simply there to help the flow of the narration mm. get from A to B to C. But inevitably, because of the players interacting, it's going to go from A to Z to B to Y to like this. And, and it's he, part of the Dungeon Master's job right. to try and keep up with that. Yeah. And sometimes you do have to um, think on your feet sometimes. But that's, that's fun. It's a challenge. And... Uh, I think it's if I, if I have to be honest I think I do in some ways I think I do prefer being the DM and the players when you're doing Not, it do you want the other players to do well are you rooting for them you absolutely kind of yeah I don't, want to, I, don't, I never want to give them an easy ride but I want to challenge them because I know from having been a player before I love encounters where you get through it by the skin of your teeth mm. that's the excitement you don't want to roll high on your dice and everything is is a breeze like your hercules you want to get through it with drama with there being peaks and troughs throughout the battle mm. and largely that's down to do with the dice but that's um that's that's the nature of dice right um but the yeah, I think any dungeon master wants their players to have that <gasps> moment. And if you can get that, then you know you're doing something right. Yeah. So when, when you're playing the game, is there an obvious, this is how we win this game? Or, or is that not a thing? That's a really interesting question. Because in theory, you don't ever win Dungeons right. Dragons. Um, sure, there's a grand adventure or many exciting side quests for you to partake in but often i'm going to sound super cheesy here but it's it's the it's the uh the journey <laughs> not the destination how do you know when it ends 
Well, in theory, um, you can just keep on playing. You could play a campaign, getting back to one of your earlier questions, what is a campaign? A campaign could be, for example, the, the main quest is rescue the king's son who's being kidnapped. And you have to then try and investigate all these clues. Um, and you'll go on various adventures and do jobs for various people to try and get information uh, about this. If you want, you could get distracted by a side quest and end up taking on a bunch of dragons in a forest. But hey, that's up to you as the players to decide that. But in theory, once you've, say, rescued the prince's son, that might take you from, say, levels one to four. And then you could sort of put a line under it. And, and then the dungeon master could say, that's technically the end of this adventure. Um, if you want, we can carry on playing in this setting with the same characters and I'll find a new adventure and we'll start with these characters starting at level four. Or you, that's a good opportunity to say to people, do you want to keep playing with these characters or would you like to roll new characters? Mm -hmm. Would you like to roll new characters that start at level one again? Or would you like to roll new characters that start at, say, level 10? It's totally up to you, but that, that's a logical um, milestone. Once you've finished that sort of main adventure, that's a point for you to say, well, we've, we've won this, if you want to call it that, but you can keep going and going and going. Yeah. If you want. So, so do you mean you, you've had a, a, a book that you've bought or downloaded and it's kind of led you on this adventure that has ended that particular narrative? And if you wanted, you could then buy or download another book that your characters could then just transfer to. So in essence, like a week later with the same people in the same room, those characters sort of wake up and turn around and they go, oh, here's another quest that we're on. Is that essentially? Absolutely, yeah. A, a kind of trope that you'd find in these sort of RPG games uh, might be the kind of, <laughs> again, this is a bit of a, a cliche, but the uh, town notice board might have you know bits of parchment on there adventurers wanted uh 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 can you retrieve the lost diamond for the mayor right. and that leads you on to another um quest it, now that could be a side quest it could be the main plot point it could be but yes the the, the key factor is is you can either buy a uh, a full-blown campaign book or you could download them from places like dmsguild.com uh, where some of these are official Wizards of the Coast adventures. Some of them are homebrew adventures that people like myself, you, uh, Bob, who lives next door, could upload. And it's a sort of pay as you uh, pay what you like sort mm -hmm. of uh, fee. Um, and some of these adventures are, of course, hit and miss. Uh, but the beauty of those adventures is you can download them and think, ah, oh, that's really cool. Mm, that's not so good. I'll swap that in with something I'll invent mm. and then think, oh, well, maybe this would be quite fun. I'll move this into here and swap this down here. And. Yeah, you can very much take these adventures as the backbone of your campaign, but the, the joy is you adding your own bits in. Sure. So essentially, because you could be thrust into this world at any point it could be the first time you've ever played and say so you're a level one it could be the hundredth game and you're a level whatever it goes up to i don't know does that mean the dm's role is very much to adapt whatever they've got in front of them to suit the characters that they've got yeah so the main the structure that i've experienced as a dm is let's pretend i'm dming for you and a bunch of other people and uh, we played the first session and it was I don't know, in a forest and there were some goblins and you're heading and you decide at the end of the session, right, there's a river. Uh, we're going to hail a um, someone, a barge, and we'll try and get on the barge and we'll end up in that village of Coneyberry. I, and then that's the end of the session. Oh, and I know that next Saturday we're going to meet up again. So then it, over the course of the week, I then have to think, right, they're going to be on the river what's going to happen on the river, they'll get to Coneyberry. I'll think of maybe two of different fun things that will happen in Coneyberry. But of course, if the players react completely differently, I should probably have a backup plan just in case. Mm. And because it's very much like a, um, uh, a T-junction, every opportunity the players have a T-junction. 
and what you'll find is the players never do what you expect them to do yeah um uh, and often it's a joy because they'll think of the craziest things that you would never ever foresee yeah um and so part of this is part bit of that I, yeah. is um uh it comes from you needing to have a bit have a few uh improvised tricks up your sleeve yeah but something you can do um this is almost like a man behind the curtain sort of a wizard of oz trick here um if the characters uh if you'd plan something you can always pick that up and conveniently drop it somewhere else where okay. the players might if, if if the players uh get diverted somehow mm. and you're like oh i don't have anything planned for that section of the woods uh, you can easily just sort of conveniently pick up something and drop it in that section of the woods because the players don't know any different. I see. Okay, that makes sense. So, can you can you give an example of this? So you're you're on that barge, you're heading towards that town, and then something happens, and then like let's just say I don't know, um, arrows start flying out of the forests and attacking you from an unknown source. Yeah. And this is the bit I don't get, because in any game that I've ever played, a board game, there's rules that say in any turn you have two actions or three actions or whatever. And from, from those two, three actions, you can choose from this list of five things. Whereas in D&D, &D, you can choose whatever you want. So, like, what are the restrictions of what you can you can do there? Like, can you say, I suddenly realised that I have magic powers that turns my arm into a 10-foot shield. Like, does the DM say, no, you don't, let me silly. Like, how does it work? That's an excellent question. Um, and it boils down to... Uh, your character creation to begin with. When you create a character for D&D, it's not just creating a funny name and saying, oh, he's got a big nose or she's got, um, you know, uh, elf-like ears. Yes, you pick a fantastical race, whether that's uh, elf, think Middle Earth, uh, plus some other things. You could be a um, uh, sort of demon-like Hellboy character if you want. Uh, the 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 options are uh, almost endless. But the important thing is you also pick a class. Now your class is like your profession of a sorts, and that determines what you're good at. So for example, if you're a barbarian, you're going to be good at hacking things first mm -hmm. without thinking. If you're a wizard, you're probably gonna be quite frail, but you're gonna have a load of different spells that you can cast. If you're a druid, you're probably going to be quite close with nature and you might be able to turn yourself into a mouse and, and all of these weird and wonderful magical things. So that, to a certain extent, uh, limits what your or, or uh, diverts your character towards a certain mm. set of skills. And in a way, that's where the role playing comes in. You, mm. You're going to play to your strengths. But. Um, on top of that, getting back to your, your question, in once, say, these arrows start flying, then what the dungeon master will say, he will, uh, I would utter the, uh, the uh, recognisable phrase, roll for initiative. And what this means is everybody rolls a d20, a 20-sided dice that looks a bit like this. And uh, everybody rolls that. And if you roll high, you will uh, normally you will be you'll be the quickest to react in combat, mm. which establishes a turn order mm. from a mechanical point of view. In theory, all of this is happening simultaneously, but from a mechanical point of view, for the game to flow, there has to be a turn order. So otherwise, people would just be shouting at once, and it would be chaos. Mm. Now, on your turn, you can uh, do one action and you can move. Now everybody has a movement speed, and again, this determines back to your uh, race, really. Uh, for example, I think some characters can move faster than others. Halflings, like Frodo, um, of course, uh, can, can't move as fast as a um, wood elf like Legolas. Um, and uh, normally you'd play on a sort of battle map mm -hmm. um, and I've got some here to show you um, you'd play on something a bit like 
if you can see it, if I hold that up to the camera, these are one inch squares. Uh -huh. And each of these uh, has a, a universal ratio of being um, uh, five feet. Right. So if you could move 25 feet, you could, for example, move 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So are these official D&D things that you bought? These uh, are, well, these actually fit together like a, um, a sort of jigsaw like this. Uh -huh. And what I do is I use a dry white pen to draw on here, um, which uh, to begin with, I didn't do that. I, um, I, I drew maps to begin with. Mm. But then I realized that's not the most efficient use of my time. Uh, but the these are, I'll just show you here. I don't know if you can read that. It says uh, dry erase dungeon tiles. OK. And um, yeah, these fit together like a jigsaw. And where where did those things from? Uh, I bought those from a online retailer, uh, okay. Zatu. OK. So that seems like a really good thing to have to add a bit of flavour, but like you said, reusable flavour to add some laws and mechanics. I would, I wish I had had those from the start because yeah. the first few sessions I was, I was just using A4 paper and drawing one inch grids on them, yeah. which only took me a couple of minutes, but then to draw the battle map, mm. um, if it's for example, um, going into a dungeon or going into a ruined tomb or going into a pub I drew it out but then of course once I've drawn on the map I, I'm having to I had to keep drawing all of these yeah. grids and it, while it's no major hassle it was something I had to keep doing week after week after week as the labor so what and, do the players use to represent themselves do you just use characters from other games or what what's yeah that? you absolutely could use plastic miniatures um what do you uh, some of my friends like to use Lego pieces, which are a pretty <laughs> good. Um, uh, yeah, my my friend Lisa used to bring a different Lego mini each week, which was uh, which was <laughs> which was nice. And um, uh, we had a druid character, so she'd bring in Lego animals as well. So if it turned into a wolf, suddenly the wolf comes on the map. But what I'd do is I again. I, you could buy minis and you could paint them, which is a whole different. Um, Let's not get into that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't have the skill, nor time, nor a budget for that. So what I again, what I do is I I just draw. Ah, okay. Minis. That that is a goblin, uh -huh. uh, for example. And I, I my rule is I'd never spend more than five minutes drawing them because otherwise it would take me way too long. Uh, I can't be that precious about what I draw. So they're 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 little. Um, uh, one inch square um, models and then they can move around the map. Mm. Traditionally, a creature such as a one of your heroes would take up a five foot or mm. a, a one inch uh, grid on the map. I know mm. they're not sort of stood like a, a starfish taking up that space, but in theory that is their area on a on a battle map from a mechanical point of view. Yeah. This is absolutely fascinating. I've got a thousand more questions to ask you, but I'm conscious of, of how long we've been chatting and taking up all your time. But um, I, I'm, I'm keen keen to see uh, how, how people react to this. So if anyone's watching this and has questions for sort of where we are now and what, what you then do next, put them in the comments here and, and maybe Tom and I will do another one of these things. I think I've probably gone from zero out of 10 understanding to like, Four. <laughs> I apologise. Um, no, I'm not, a... I was hoping to get to one. I think getting to four is fantastic. But my interest has gone from like 80 out of 100 to 100 out of 100. And, and that's kind of the key thing is like, I'm intrigued to find out more about this. And I really want to start my own campaign. I think understanding the importance of the characters has really cemented a lot in my mind about what the rules and, you know, yeah. how, how this land works. I would I would suggest that it all starts with character creation mm -hmm. or at least re taking a look at a character sheet or reading about the different characters and the different races and the different classes that you can be. And that will give you a, a, uh, maybe a, a launch pad. Oh, I like the sound of being a monk uh, uh, elf. Mm. I really. I, that just sounds cool to me. I would like to play as that character. Their abilities sound cool. I'll be that. And then you, from there, you, you, you go on.
Um, My last question, what, what's your name? What's your DM name? Is that something I even exists? Is that a question I can ask? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, the DM doesn't really have a character name as such. They uh-huh. are like a um, uh, almost like a, an unspoken sort of <laughs> deity of sorts. Okay. Um, you're normally known as the DM. Okay. Or, or the um, insert swear word here, DM by the by the players. Um, in a love of like we're gonna get comments going. Oh, go to time lap thirty six or whatever. Jim asked such a noob question like, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the point of this i want to create like a safe environment where people can ask city questions and absolutely just, yeah a safe answer um but tom thank you so much for your time today uh, we'll, we'll hopefully do another one of these things again if people have interest i i certainly have to have, have, have interest so maybe we'll just do it again and i won't bother recording it but tom thank you so much for your time no problem at all